Today we welcome with pleasure it's um, the Scouts from Troop 55. And it's a, next time, guys, it's a, you can sit a little closer, okay? You don't have to sit all the way in the back, but that's okay. We're glad that you're here. Go ahead and register to, uh, your attendance in the, uh, in, the, in the cards that are there at the end of the pews and pass them on down, get to know you folks who are sitting around you, all right? Also at this time, if you got prayer requests, at, uh, go ahead and fill those out so that you can put them in the offering plate. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries? Barbara's got one, I know. Don't, don't you, honey? I do. Lyle's birthday is next Saturday. Oh, that's right. And it's followed by mine three days later. <laughs> <laughs> Friday, yes. Anniversary on Saturday, that's great. Oh, way in the back. Another on Friday, all right. Yes, Ray. Anniversary tomorrow, very good, congratulations, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the also on the one Okay. That's a good day. That's a real good day. Yes, Mickey. Oh. And it uh, if you hadn't have said that, we wouldn't have let uh, we, we, would, we would have been nice to you, Mickey, and not told her, all right? Any others? All right. Since this is uh, Boy Scout Sunday, any of you who have ever been a Boy Scout or a Cub Scout or an Explorer, it's, uh, would you please stand? And one of the leaders also, go ahead and stand, all right? All right. And uh, come on, guys. That's right. And very good. Also, it's, uh, go ahead and sit down, but if you've you know, an Eagle Scout. Anybody been an Eagle Scout? All right. Oh, very good. I was uh, I was a Bo Cub Scout, a Boy Scout, an Explorer. N never quite got to Eagle. We we did camping instead of worked on merit badge. You guys got something for us? Here it goes. All right, we'll turn that on. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Scout Sunday. I am Troop 55 Scoutmaster Joe Emac, along with one of my assistant leaders, Bill Loth. So I'd like to thank the United Methodist Church, Pastor Craig, the entire congregation, and our wonderful group of scouts and families that are able to join us this morning for our Scout Sunday celebration in this 108th year of scouting. This church has been chartering our troop for approximately 47 of those years, and we look forward for many more. Okay, this year Troop 55 proudly added three more names to the Eagle Rank plaque downstairs, Kiefer and Kyle Newman and Matthew Beauvais. This troop also has several more scouts currently on the Eagle Trail, so stay tuned. Nationally, 6% of Boy Scouts achieve the rank of Eagle and 6% of Girl Scouts achieve the Gold Award. I think we're doing pretty good in that department. So after the service this morning, we'd like to invite everyone downstairs. We'll be hosting a fellowship hour 
we hope you might take a few minutes to stop by our scout corner downstairs and view some of the items we brought to share with you, uh, as well as interact with our scouts and families for a few minutes. Uh, the continued success of Troop 55 would not happen without the support from, again, the church, Pastor Craig, our chartered organization representative, Sandra Hartman Newman, and the entire congregation. Your support allows us leaders, committee members, to instill character, leadership, and citizenship into our young men of tomorrow. All scouts present today have on the 2018 Scout Sunday BSA patch, and I would like to keep with the Troop 55 Scout Sunday tradition started in the last few years and present Pastor Craig with one also. So, being a leader in Troop 55, as you can tell, is a rewarding job, and we thank you all again for the honor and privilege of that job. Thank you. We'd like now to, uh, to welcome any first-time visitors with us this, this Sunday. It, uh, just raise your hand. We don't want to embarrass you. We just got a little something for you. All right. So let's all stand and pass. Oh, there's going to be a fundraiser for Alice Lee. Alice is a lifelong Clinton resident who has terminal pancreatic cancer. If you're interested in tickets or making a contribution, please see Jackie downstairs at Fellowship. Also, we've got Valentine's Day coming up. And if you want to have a, a nice romantic evening. Here at the church, we'll be providing candlelight at 7 o'clock. We'll have a little fruit of the vine, a little crusty bread, some piano music, some organ music, a little choir music to set the mood, and we'll also be celebrating Ash Wednesday at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Let us lift up our minds and hearts to our loving creator and sustainer. Very good, very good. All right. Thank you. If you're able, would you please stand and join us in the call to worship?
the Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silence, before whom is a devastating fire, around about whom is a mighty storm. God calls to the heavens above and to the earth, that the people may be judged. Gather to me, my faithful ones, you made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Please remain standing as we sing our opening hymn number 152, I Sing the Almighty Power of God. Please be seated. Would you please join with me? The prayer of confession as printed in your bulletin. Creator God, we are grateful for the fact that you have an infinite capacity for surprise. There are times when the power of the moment astonishes us and we are able to catch a fleeting glimpse of your glory. We are like Peter. We want to build booths. We do not know what to say. When there are times when you seem so far away, we long for the mountaintop experiences which are altogether infrequent. We easily grow impatient. We are quick to complain. We question, 
Teach us to resist the impulse to cling to things which do not fully matter. Help us to remember that you unfold your finest work within the fuel view of ordinary people who are engaged in ordinary life situations. Increase our capacity for surprise. Amen. Let's all take a moment for silent prayers of confession. Hear these words of assurance. Your fear is turned into confidence. Your night of despair has become a morning of hope. Your confinement has given away to freedom. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And you please join us all together, lifting our voices in the words of our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Please join with me the prayer for illumination as printed in your bulletin. God of wonder, you fill creation with light and shadow, the glistening snow at dawn on the mountain peak, the ribbon of weeping white light across the silent waves can take the breath away. We want to hold on to those moments forever, but you invite us to look beyond them to your beloved Son, who left transfigured glory to redeem broken humanity. Cover us with a cloud of your presence that we may listen to his voice this day and follow his way. Amen. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is a God who said, let light shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Thank you. 
Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please, let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended into a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. I invite our young people to come forward with their offering for the Heifer Project. And as they do, all of us can sing number 94. children's sermon and it's going to be on symbols. Um, do you know what a symbol is? Yeah. Well, do you know what a symbol is? Um, it's like, um, like a picture. <laughs> what is that a symbol of? A candy cane. A candy cane. And when did we have candy canes? Christmas. Do you know what this um, candy cane represents? Well, sort of God's birthday, yeah, but it could be a shepherd's hook. Remember, it's red and white, a shepherd's hook, yeah? And if you turn it upside down, what is it? I did it backwards. It's a letter J, but I made it backwards. Oops. Oh, well. And J stands for, J stands for Jesus, doesn't it? Even, wow, you heard that, J. Good, okay. Oh, wow. Oh, I'm here, to tell, I'm here to tell you about another kind of symbol, and that's the pretzel. And here is, it's a pretzel. Okay. Well, it is that way. But the pretzel was invented a long time ago by a monk, and he had some leftover bread um, strips that he wanted to do something with so that the kids could have 
something to eat. And during the season of Lent, which we're just getting ready to go into now, you give up something that you really, really like. What do you think you would give up for Lent? <coughs> You really like bananas? Yeah, I, I like bananas too, and that would be hard for me to give up bananas. I eat them with peanut butter. Do you like peanut butter on yours? Yes. Well, peanut butter are good too. Well, those are things that you could give up for Lent in, in order to worship Jesus and let, let Jesus know that you really, really love him and you're willing to give up something so that he... I, I like potato chips. Would you give up potato chips for Lent? Oh, that's a good deal. That's a good deal. <coughs> Pretzels are made with a long strip and then they're folded so that it looks like somebody's praying. Like that. That's where they used to pray. When, yeah, just like that. Can you see that in the pretzel? Can you see it? Can you see it? Oh, yeah. See that? So when you eat a pretzel in the future, you can think about how long ago they were made. And now they're being made in Pennsylvania, just a little bit of something that I read online last night. But you can remember when you have a pretzel that you, it's a symbol to pray. And you can pray at the time, OK? That's a real pretzel. That is a real pretzel. This is another picture of a pretzel, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Why did I make so that you could see them and you could have them during fellowship time downstairs? I'll put them on the table, and you can taste them. These are homemade pretzels, not like the kind you buy in the store. These are soft pretzels. Me too. They're really good. It, warm right out of the oven. Come to my house. <laughs> They're really good. Yeah. All right, so we're going to pass them out downstairs, and I think we're going to have a, a prayer now. Dear God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for caring about us and loving us. Amen. You can go back to your seats and or Sunday school, wherever you have to go now. Thank you.
Reading now from the Gospel according to Mark in the ninth chapter, starting at the second verse. So listen for the Word of God. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. One of the most vivid memories I have of being a Boy Scout was my 50-mile hike along the long trail into Vermont. Is there still a 50-mile hike that's done these days? Now, I know I'm old, but I remember my backpack being attached to a wooden pack frame that my father and I had made. There were no aluminum lightweight frames yet on the market. And for days, we hiked the trail, surrounded by woods. And occasionally, we might hit a clearing or a pond, but mostly all you saw were trees for days on end. And then the final day, we all of a sudden came out of the trees and onto a great slope. It wasn't an ordinary grassy slope. It was a ski trail on Bromley Mountain. Now this was well before my skiing days. And I remember how steep it was. It was so steep, I was afraid of slipping and falling to my ultimate death down that trail. We were told to keep facing the mountain and literally crawl up because of the steepness of it. Now, while worrying about dying, we finally got to the top. And after what seemed an eternity, we were coaxed to finally turn around and look out. We could see for miles and miles and miles. We had been granted a whole new perspective. The whole world had been transformed before our eyes. And we had seen, we saw something that we had never, ever seen before. I had not yet ever flown in a plane. So this was probably the highest I had ever been. And I was enthralled by how far one could see and how small all of the human marks on the landscape seemed. Up on that mountaintop, you get a perspective unlike any that you get down in a valley 
are walking through the trees. The whole world looks different and takes on a whole different perspective. Little wonder then that the Bible should speak of mountains as places of revelation. Moses had to go up on a mountain to get close to God to learn more about God's ways and then bring down those Ten Commandments. And in this morning's Gospel from Mark, Jesus leads his disciples up a mountain. And there he was transfigured before them. In that moment, on that mountain, everything changed. Mark's attempts to describe the change by depicting it as a change in Jesus' clothing. His clothes were shining, glistening white, whiter than white. Obviously, words fail at such moments. Something is happening, to be sure. But what happened strains the ability of our language to describe it. The dazzling radiance is beyond description. So therefore, forgive me if I am unable to speak about this event as it ought to be depicted. Because we're talking about a great mystery here. A mystery that defies our powers of description. This is what transfiguration is. And so when Peter, James, and John are at last able to open their eyes and gaze on the glistening sight, they see Elijah, who we heard in the story just before our children's sermon, who was taken up in the chariot into heaven to be close with God, and Moses, who had been on that mountaintop, shining besides Jesus. And in the lesson that we heard about how Elijah was mysteriously taken up to heaven, he was so close to God, so very close, that Elijah was easily swept on that chariot into heaven. Moses, up on the mountaintop, spoke to God. Thus, these two great figures of the Hebrew faith we now know are very close to God. So how do you react to something like this? You know, Peter blurts out something about, wow, it's great that we're here. Let's pitch a tent for each one of you. Maybe Peter was a scout. <laughs> Trying to always be prepared for anything. But Mark says he didn't know what to say because he was terrified. Have you ever had such a strange, terrifying mountaintop experience? What's the source of the terror? Well, if you've ever had such a dazzling, mystical experience, you will probably confirm that it is terrifying. For in such a moment, to be taken beyond your normal categories of understanding and expectation. You don't know what to do with this. Words fail. Our previous experiences through which we live our lives all of a sudden crumble and disappear. We're on unfamiliar ground. We know something happened but what was it? Perhaps Peter wanted to build in order to fix this moment forever. Don't let it go. To domesticate the experience. Nail it down, so to speak. But while Peter is speaking, a cloud overshadows them. And then there's this voice. 
This is my beloved son. Listen to him. I hear the voice saying to Peter, put down those tent pegs. Don't do anything. Don't talk. Don't plan. Just listen. Stop. Look. Listen. Is this not in part a parable of us on Sunday mornings? My image of us on Sunday morning is that we come here with our little notepads to take down our assignment for the week. I guess they're probably, nobody's got notepads anymore, right? It's probably take out your iPhone and put it in under your notes. But we come here to figure out what it is that we're supposed to do during the week. This week, I want you to work on your sexism or your racism. And then come back next week, and I'll give you another assignment. And sometimes people say, I come to worship in order to find out where I've gone wrong and to get help to live my life better. Now, I suppose that's okay up to a point, but there are those wonderful, delicious moments in worship when we rise above our plans and projects and when we are taken to the mountaintop. And at that moment, we are given a whole new perspective. We are given a view of God. In such moments, we aren't supposed to plan. We're not supposed to program. We're not supposed to describe. We're not supposed to fix it. Rather, we're simply supposed to take it in. Enjoy it. To listen to whatever words God has to speak to us. Now, note in the story when the moment of transfiguration is over, one, the voice stops, and there is again silence. Jesus stands alone on the mountaintop, and then the disciples accompany him back down from the mountain. And Jesus doesn't give them any instructions or new orders except to tell them, don't talk about this until later. Because it really won't become clear until after I die and I'm raised. But I wonder if Jesus needed to order them not to tell anyone. Because if you have ever had such a strange, dramatic, mystical experience on a mountaintop or somewhere else, you're probably not likely to tell anybody about it. For one thing, such experiences are intimate, deeply personal, and wonderful. But more importantly, such experiences are really tough to put into words tough to explain to somebody else. No, perhaps even more important than that, there is something about such an experience that is embarrassing. Yes, embarrassing. Years ago, Morton Kelsey did a survey of Roman Catholic laypeople and found out that most laypersons reported to have had a mystical, life-changing experience of the kind described here. However, most of the people had never told anyone about it. Why? You know the reason. Most of them said people would have thought I was crazy. Isn't that what we think about when we think about talking about religion? I don't want to talk about that because people will think I'm crazy. When people are confronted by some mysterious intrusion into the course of their lives, something beyond their accustomed categories, it's typical of them to dismiss it as if that person was crazy. So we tend not to talk about such things in public. However, 
I know you well enough to know that you've had such moments. It may be it was on a mountaintop in which you looked down into the valley and saw the whole world differently than you had seen it before. Maybe it was here on a Sunday morning in worship when you felt really, really close to God as if God appeared before you in dazzling radiance. Perhaps it was when you were alone and quiet in your own room or in your car or in prayer or in meditation. I don't know what to make of such moments, but perhaps that's not the point. You see, because I, right there I'm acting like Peter. I'm wanting to define such moments, to pin them down, to shelter them, to tell you what you're supposed to do with them afterwards. But no, we return down from the mountaintop to the valley. We may not know what to do next, but to say what to say or where to go. However, the important thing is to listen to him, to hear that reassuring voice. Just stop and look and listen. If the voice, the voice from above at his baptism is true, as we're trying it, to believe it is, the voice that says this enigmatic Jesus is my son, the beloved, God in the flesh, then there are going to be gaps, space between us and Jesus, for we are not God. We can't know everything. We don't have all the answers. But maybe in the long run, as we stumble after him, sometimes seeing for sure, sometimes not knowing what's going on, the point is not to have answers but to have Jesus. Jesus in all of his life-giving presence. And that's better. Better even than having all the answers. I think such moments are indispensable to our faith. For the past Sundays of this year, we've been watching Jesus as he moves through the Gospel of Mark. Many times what Jesus does seems strange and hard to explain. You know, we wonder, what the heck is going on here? We, like the disciples, ask, who is this? And then in some stunning moment of worship, in some dazzling glimpse, we see who Jesus is. He's put in context with the other great people of God from the past. And there's a voice speaking explicitly to you, to me, to us. This is my son. Listen to him. And so we listen. And so we see. And so we believe. So take time to stop, to look, and to listen. Amen. Amen. What is it that God has said to you? Where is it that you have encountered Christ? We find that as we stop, as we look, as we listen, we hear a voice calling us into a newness of life, a life that is not just for ourselves, but is for others, and that we share in the ministry that God has called us to. And we do that in a variety of ways. It's wonderful to have the talents of our scouts, 
that are a part of this congregation. It's wonderful to see the variety of activities that we can join together in to make this community a better place. And it's wonderful that we can go forth and be the people that God wants us to be, sharing that of ourselves in so many different ways. So when we make an offering, it's an offering of ourselves. We bring forth our prayers, and we bring forth our resources, saying that these are to be shared, that they are given to us by God, and that they can continue to be used for God's purposes. So it is not under compulsion, but because we want to, that we are generous and are able to give. And so, thankfully and graciously, we make our offering. Join in the prayer of dedication is printed in the bulletin. We pray that our giving, as well as all aspects of our lives, may reflect your spirit within us a spirit of boldness, a spirit of generosity, a spirit of love, a spirit of self discipline, a spirit of intense desire to live a productive and fruitful life. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Okay, now you can take out your iPads or iPods or your, your iPhones and uh, write down your assignment for the week. These are the joys and concerns that have come to us from the congregation. We ask that you keep them in your prayers not only this morning, but throughout the week as well. Dear Heavenly Father, help to keep my honor bright and teach me that integrity of character is my most priceless possession. Grant that I may do my best day today and strive to do even better tomorrow. Teach me that duty is a friend and not an em enemy, and help me face even the most disagreeable task cheerfully. Give me the faith to understand my purpose of life. Open my mind to the truth and fill my heart with love. I'm thankful for all the blessings you have bestowed upon my country. Help me to do my duty to my country and to know that a good nation must be made from good men. Help me remember my obligation to obey the scout law and give me understanding so that it is more than mere words. May I never tire of the joy of helping other people or look the other way when someone is in, in need. You may given me the gift of a body, make me wise enough to keep it health that I might serve better. You are the source of all wisdom. Help me to have an alert mind, teach me to think and help me to learn discipline. In all that I do and in every challenge I face, help me to know the differences between right and wrong, and lead me in obedience and the straight path to a worthy goal. Amen.
final hymn is printed in your bulletin, Shine, Jesus, Shine. And if you are able, will you please stand? And we're going to start with the first verse, which is on the fifth line. When we get to the very end, you're going to repeat that last line, Send forth your word, flood the nation, uh, and let Lord, let there be light. And then say again, let there be light. It'll be spectacular. <laughs> You've sung the anthem. <laughs> but remember, stop, look, listen, and then go forth to bring the message to those you encounter. 
to do what it is that you can to alleviate the burdens of those you meet. And know that you do not go alone, but that Christ goes with you. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, go with us all, not only this day, not only this week, but even forevermore. Amen.